everybody just looks at each other. And I was like, yeah, con de ingo. Because I have a habit of switching the tones and it's that simple. And they, nobody got mad. Nobody threw anything at me. But it's a running joke to this day with my family. And I made a, an Instagram reel on it that did quite well based on that joke. And it's good that you can all laugh about it today. Yes. Welcome to You Don't Know Vietnam, the show that demystifies Vietnam for global audiences by talking to the creatives, trendsetters, and business owners who are taking on the market. Forget what you thought you knew about Vietnam, it's no longer that, as you're about to find out. I'm Ian Payton, co-founder of We Create Content, a content marketing agency that builds audiences for global brands in Vietnam. On today's episode of You Don't Know Vietnam, I'm talking to content creator, TV personality, and teacher, Phuc Ma. Phuc Ma, real name Brandon Hurley, has risen to popularity in Vietnam by mastering the art of speaking Vietnamese and being really funny with it on YouTube, TikTok, and television. He's got more than half a million subscribers on YouTube and almost a million followers on TikTok, a channel that he was once reluctant to post on. Today, he tells me what makes his comedy work in Vietnam, why satire is so easy to get wrong, and the importance of checking yourself before you go and wreck yourself with cultural no-nos. He talks me through the six Vietnamese tones, how to address people correctly, and the kinds of slang being used by Gen Z in Vietnam today. Phuc Ma Oi! What's going on? Thanks for joining me on You Don't Know Vietnam. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the invite. It's a real pleasure, you know, and I see everything that you're doing on social media. And I think that me and you live completely different lives in Vietnam. Someone like me who gets by on a very limited amount of street Vietnamese and someone like you who's just completely mastered it. How's it unlocked life for you here learning Vietnamese in the way that you have? That's quite the compliment. Thank you so much. And it is an interesting comparison after talking to you and getting to know how long you've actually spent in Vietnam and seeing that we are at different ends of the spectrum. I will say, yes, it has uh, changed how I view life in Vietnam, the Vietnamese people, the culture, and all the way down to the food. And it really opens up uh, a lot of interactions that I wouldn't have had if I didn't speak the language and whether or not I have a YouTube channel or people know who I am, the fact that I can converse with locals on a regular basis, introduce myself and ask them questions and give them an experience that they don't usually get with other foreigners, it makes life in Vietnam a lot more fun. And you're quite funny with it as well, aren't you? Thank you, sir. Yes, that's really been the key feature with my channel since the beginning. From the first newspaper interview I did, I said, I want to be the funniest foreigner making YouTube in Vietnam. I know even with years of studying, I will not be the most fluent. I will not sound the most fluent, but I want to have a, a part of my channel that just makes people laugh from Vietnamese to non-Vietnamese. If you know anything about the culture, it will bring a smile to your face watching it. It may not be your kind of humor, but I guarantee something I do can make most people laugh. So what would you say is the nature of your humor? that you've really nailed and does work in Vietnam. From the very beginning, I liked to play the character of a foreigner who lives here, who wants to fit in, who speaks some Vietnamese, but still is missing some parts of what he should know. From the first viral video, I was walking around in women's pajamas and people thought it was about being just ridiculous and funny. And even though it was more about, I wanted to fit in, I need to buy a traditional outfit, so I buy a traditional outfit, but it's for women. I want to get a traditional pet because I see the guys in my alleys, they have cockfighting chickens. So I want to get one too. It turns out I buy a hen and I don't realize it. And I get the chicken so nobody steals my dog and eats it. Yet my sister stole the chicken and ate it. So it's literally just a bunch of ironic punchlines that fit into my videos where I'm trying to be a part of the society. I act like I know everything but there's still parts that I just don't get. So it's a bit goofy in a way. For sure. And, and when you get into Vietnamese television and media, you'll see that they have a lot of that slapstick humor. One of the last TV shows I did was Hang Amo Dim, Two Days, One Night. 
And it's a very popular show in Vietnam. And basically, as I hung out with these guys, I was in awe on how well they were able to improv and come up with these jokes and these puns and these little plays, if you will. And yes, I can't compete with that in Vietnamese, but I thought about myself doing that in English on TV in America. And I said, those guys are very talented. So I came to appreciate how Vietnamese humor is much different from what I'm used to in the West. It's very slapstick. And uh, you have to, as we say in Vietnamese, yeah, we thought, uh, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Does Vietnamese language lend itself to that as well, would you say? It seems to be quite a playful language with lots of implicit meanings, double entendres, perhaps, metaphors. Is that fair to say? I don't know the language as deeply as you and deep enough to answer that question. But it seems to me that there's an element of playfulness about the language. Is that true? I believe so. And it takes me a little while to pick up the new parts. But being around Vietnamese for so long, not only in Vietnam, but my wife's Vietnamese, and I spend a lot of time with her family, I see how much they literally call it which is a pun or play with letters, play with words. For example, when you say the word secret, be mut, you can switch it up and you say, but me, which you go from secret to reveal the secret, but it's flipping the tones and flipping the words. And I see that quite a bit. Yeah. A lot of times when Vietnamese are joking, I've seen that they use a lot of ding laum and which is basically slang where they flip the words and flip the accents. And I see that as something that's very easy to do in their language because so many words are similar. And is there a thin line to tread as well with regards to getting satire right or wrong in Vietnam? I imagine it's quite tricky to walk that line. And how do you do it? That's a good question. The first five-hour video I ever had, I even told my wife, I told my friend that helped me out with the idea. I said, look, if I get 40% or more dislike on this video, I'm not going to continue with this style of humor. I will understand that the Vietnamese society does not appreciate my type of humor and does not find this funny. And this will be the test. And surprisingly, that video got millions of views and it kept about a 98, 99% like ratio, as ridiculous as it was. So once I saw that, I said, all right, the floodgates have opened. Let's go. But yes, you do have to be very careful in this society because Vietnamese people are more of a collective society. And if you make some of them mad, there's a chance you're going to make a lot of them mad with whatever it is that you're doing. There's been some examples where it's gone wrong for other foreigners who speak Vietnamese really well in the past, right? Yes. Right around the time I started YouTube, there was a famous YouTuber with over a million subscribers and he made some jokes online that in his home country of America could be seen as funny and something that's quite normal to make fun of politicians and people in higher places. But in Vietnam, you don't do that. And that was a, a good lesson for myself as well as other foreign content creators not to do it. But even recently, there was a guy, small brained American. Uh, I got tagged in these videos quite a bit and he went around Vietnam and changed what people were saying in the English subtitles. And he ended up in the newspapers. I had a lot of people tagging me in the commentary videos about him. And it's things like that. It's again, in America, people would brush it off. But when you come to Vietnam and then you make them look bad, especially the people that were just trying to help you, they really don't appreciate that. For sure. So it's a real challenge for you then, it sounds like, to, yes, continue with your personal brand and your differentiator of using satire and wit, but not taking the piss with it to the point where you get yourself cancelled in Vietnamese culture. My wife, I have to give her a lot of credit. She stopped me from making a few videos. They weren't to the point where I'd be kicked out of the country, but I had a couple of satire videos that I thought were hilarious in terms of an American sense of humor. But my wife, most of the time, she reviews everything I do before I put it out. And no, don't put that out. Cut that part out. Vietnamese, they will not enjoy that. They will not like that. And I take her word for it because she's Vietnamese, born and raised. So she knows more than I do. Okay, so every year, basically, I have some kind of viral hit. And sometimes it's because of a collaboration. Sometimes it's just dumb luck. But every year I have some kind of viral hit. And in 2021... There is a Muay Thai world champion who has Muay Thai gyms in Saigon and beloved by the community. His name is Yuin Yet. So we film videos for their channel. And then they say, hey, make a video for your channel. And I said, yeah, guys, we've been filming all day. We filmed like six videos. I said, no, no, here, we'll just take the camera. Just 
let's do something like a challenge. I was like, all right, but I'm going to be really rude. Like I'm going to come in here and I just met you in yet too. And I'm, but I'm going to call him my, and I'm going to be thou and I'm going to make fun of him and everything else. So we just went straight through no script or whatever else. And I put that video out and it was my biggest ever video on YouTube. Total, it got, I think, 11 million views on all my platforms. And even one fighting championship reached out to me about using it because he's a fighter for 1FC. And I wasn't even going to make that video. I was very rude, yet somehow it worked out in my favor. Did your wife check on that video? Yes, but you could tell that we were playing around. Some people did comment, like, who taught this foreigner to speak so rudely? This guy is the worst. With 10 million views, you're going to get comments like that. And I still get comments on it. It's still getting thousands of views a day three years later. But for the most part, people got the joke and they understood that it was all just for fun. It's interesting, isn't it? Because we actually met through a project we were doing for Netflix, where Netflix were promoting the tourist guide to love. And as their agency, I think we suggested you to join in the shopping mall challenge. Well, this market challenge. I say that to say that Netflix knew they needed to grow in Vietnam, but weren't in Vietnam. And they ended up calling us their scouts on the ridge for Vietnam. They needed a local partner that they could trust that says, don't do that in Vietnam. This is going to work. This isn't going to work. That's an absolute no, because it's so easy to get it wrong, I think, as a foreigner. And it's interesting for me that even though you've been here for nine years, you're deeply integrated into the culture. You're fluent in Vietnamese, but there's still a chance of getting something wrong. And your wife almost is still your scout on the ridge there. <laughs> yeah, I see. I see the analogy because that makes complete sense, especially with a big company like Netflix, because if you did something very bad, you could get them basically banned from the country in terms of making movies here. Pronouns are a complete minefield in Vietnam for me. I'm always getting them wrong. And so there's no I and you, right? It's older or younger person. Yeah, it's an I and you, but it's depending on the context of who you're talking to. I went to Korea a few times and when you get on the subway in Korea, they have the old people pregnant women handicapped seats on the ends of the, the train. And I'd watch someone, an older lady sitting there, but then an even older lady comes on and she stands up for her because they know their place in terms of age and the elders. Now flip that to Vietnam, you have the pronouns. Pronouns are so important to Vietnamese to where if someone's older than you, you're going to call them an older pronoun. But if they're as old as your mother, you're going to call them an even older pronoun. And if they're as old as your grandmother, an even older pronoun. And I've seen older ladies being 40, 50 years old, talking to an older lady and calling themselves con. Now, I'm not saying that's the traditional way, but trying to give so much respect that they're referring to themselves as a kid and this older lady as you know, mother, grandmother level. And I see a lot of respect in those terms. And then they break down where you get informal with the pronouns and they have thou and my, which you never say to people that you don't know. And you definitely don't say it to older people. The traditional one that everyone learns first is ban for you and toy for I. But there are so, so many ways to say it. And even in the North, they have different ones that I'll hear. And I'm like, what is that? Uh, it's a constant learning process. I have a real problem with Ming people. For example, in a service or transactional environment, whether or not the person looks about the same age as you or not, you're supposed to M them, call them a younger person. Yes, they are supposed to treat you as an older person, even if you're not. And then you have the level of when I call an older lady, Jake, and she's obviously in her 40s and I'm in my 30s. She go M and I'm like, I know it's not M, but I will oblige. And the same thing, I would try to be polite and call a lady maybe at 50, 55, go, which is the older level of that. And yet she will still go to J because they know once they pass that threshold, they've reached the older stage of their life. And of course they want the respect, but when it comes to a younger guy, they still want to be seen as younger in my experience. I've also found that I will speak to a go, which is loosely translated as auntie. And she'll go, no, I'm your chi, I'm your older sister. And then other times I'll go, hi, older sister. And she'll go, well, I'm your auntie. You can never really get it right 
Yes and no. Yes, you can get it right, but it's not always going to be right to the person you're speaking to. And people have often commented, why do I refer to myself as folk when I'm talking about myself like in a third person sense in my videos? And the answer is simple. I don't want to have to think about the pronoun. What do I call myself? Gone, im, an. I don't want to think about that. So if I said, oh, folk moon, I want, blah, blah, blah. I just refer to myself in the third person a lot of times and it throws some people off, but that's my way of avoiding the pronouns. I guess a benefit of doing the pronouns dance is, is it's an icebreaker. You get to speak to people, figure out your positions and springboard from that. One thing I would say though, is that as let's say a foreigner is coming to Vietnam to do business, set up a company to grow their brand in Vietnam, a little bit of Vietnamese can go a long way. I find it's a good way of, of, yeah, getting closer to people, opening up conversations and making things a little bit warmer. So what would you say then is the best thing to try for somebody new coming to Vietnam? Is it just the pronouns? I would say the pronouns are not important as a foreigner. And in fact, you are going to get a whole lot of leeway when you say things wrong as a foreigner. There's plenty of stories of people saying curse words when they're trying to speak Vietnamese and Vietnamese, they just laugh it off. In my experience, they don't get upset with you saying things the wrong way. As a foreigner, they appreciate the effort. So instead of worrying about the pronouns, just stick to the basic toy or mun. I prefer mun. And then ban. Yeah. And you could just go back and forth with mun and ban. And then... The easiest way I can explain it, the way it worked for me before I got a private tutor, was just a flow chart. And that's how I treated it when I first started learning. And I used Bintan Market, the tourist market in District 1, to build this, where the first one, you come up and you ask how they're doing or how much something costs. And then you go from there, what's your name? How old are you? Do you have a husband? Do you have a wife yet? Do you have kids yet? And as you can build on those questions and you know what answers to expect and you know what questions they're going to ask you, you can go deeper in those conversations and the conversations can last longer. The, the conversation flows in a certain way. People comment on my videos. Why do you say the same things to Vietnamese in your videos? It's how many different things do you say to strangers when you first meet them in your life, in your own language? It's not that much different ways to say, what's up? How are you? How's your day been? But past that, you're going to ask the same basic questions. So that's what I would recommend to foreigners is to obviously try to get the tones and the sounds down, but get the basic questions out of the way. And then it's almost a fake it till you make it, where if you can do a five minute conversation, you go, wow, this guy's fluent. <laughs> he answered four of my questions. He must know Vietnamese language A to Z. And you said about the Vietnamese giving you quite a bit of leeway when you accidentally swear. Is that when you mean trying to pronounce a word, but you use the wrong tone and actually say something really vulgar without actually knowing it, perhaps? Perfect example. When my wife and I got married, her and her family, they owned a Wan Yao, which is a beer drinking restaurant. And being walking distance from her house, we would just be there every single night. And the whole family would be there and cousins and everyone would be there. And there was a night where the family's at a table and I think I was working at a daycare at that time. I'd be up nice and early for the little kids. And I went to wave to everybody and my mother-in-law, newly mother-in-law, she said, where are you going? And I was trying to say, I'm going to sleep. And instead of saying, which is I'm going to sleep, I said, which is a slut or a bitch and is stupid. So basically, you stupid slut in front of the whole family. And they're like, this is the guy you picked? Of all the foreigners here, you picked this guy? Calling your mom a stupid slut in front of the family? No way. Everybody just looks at each other. And I was like, yeah, conde ingo. Because I have a habit of switching the tones. And it's that simple. And they, nobody got mad. Nobody threw anything at me. But it's a running joke to this day with my family. And I made a, an Instagram reel on it that did quite well based on that joke. And it's good that you can all laugh about it today. Yes. That's a corker of an example. I love it. So the tones are super important. Would you say that's the first thing you need to get down if you're serious about learning Vietnamese? Yeah, I think it's important to focus on those first, simply because, okay, so when we studied in TESOL, the teaching English as a secondary other language, they talked about fundamental errors. Whereas if you don't correct 
an error in pronunciation or intonation with a new English speaker early on, it's going to be much harder for them to correct it down the road because they've been saying it wrong for so long. And that was my problem. My first year and a half in Vietnam, I, I took a two week Vietnamese course with my TESOL program. And I said, man, this language is quite difficult. I don't know how long I'm going to stay here. I'm not really going to focus on this. And I would just learn funny comebacks or punchlines where someone would ask my name and I'd say, oh, my name is Hurley, Dep Chai, you know, how to say handsome and things like that. But I didn't really focus on the language. And that being said, I would just say everything very flat. So I knew a lot of words, but they were just flat and I didn't pay attention to the tones. So when I actually got a tutor in 2016 and I started focusing on the tones, it leads to errors like the example I gave you, but also when you listen to my speech, when I'm doing like a, a long monologue on TV in Vietnamese, there are some errors there that have been around since the beginning. And although I'm proud of those errors and I don't really mind, it, it's apparent that you should focus on the tones early on. So essentially the six tones we've got are no tones, so it's completely flat. What would you say the next one is? Generally, when you're watching these videos that teach the lessons, basically the word yo is the word for tone. So that goes up, yo. And then the first one is sec, yo sec. And that is the uptone. And the good thing about the names for these tones is that they have the tone that they're speaking about. So sec goes up. The next one, yo huin, which is a falling tone. It goes down, huin. After that, you would go to yo hoi. And the word hoi is to ask. Kao hoi is a question. So that's why I call it the question tone. And then it sounds like you're asking a question. Then you have the squiggly tone which is not the official name. I believe nga means to fall in the north. I think that's the northern dialect, but it's the falling tone where it's like nga. Up north, they break when they're saying it. But as I mentioned, in the south, the squiggly tone and the question tone have the same sound. So it makes it easier. It makes it five tones instead of six. So you have that squiggly tone and then you have the heavy tone, uh, yao nang, and the word nang actually means heavy and uses the dot. That's the dot underneath. And of course, as you mentioned, yao ngang, the flat tone. So you have flat, up, down, question, squiggly, and dot. Yeah, six tones. I'm sure all of our global audiences now are like, yeah, I completely get it. Thank you. <laughs> I heard about one sentence that uses all the different tones on the same word and still makes sense. Are you aware of that? Uh, yeah, so the one that I've always heard, so ban, like we talked about before, you, bun, which is busy, and ban, to sell, ban, table, and bung is the northern way of saying dirty. So it's you're busy selling a dirty table. Obviously, you wouldn't say it like that. You should say it in a different way. But basically, ban, bung, ban, bung. That's an example I've always heard. I find that communicating in Vietnamese from afar isn't going to work like with Google Translate, for example. It's just not going to fly. It's not going to cut it. It's not going to connect. Why is Google Translate often so wrong in Vietnamese? I think it's getting better. And on social media, I'll be looking at comments underneath posts and I'll press C translation and it makes literally zero sense. It's just gibberish. Why is Vietnamese so difficult to translate through apps? That's a great question. The first reason is uh, regional differences in the language. So the example I gave you with all the same words in different tones in the same sentence, the last word was bung, which is dirty in Northern Vietnamese. But until I collaborated with Chris Lewis, another foreign content creator that speaks the Northern voice, I didn't know what bung was. He was saying bung, and I'm like, what, what the heck is he talking about? So if you translate that sentence, it'll say dirty. If you're in the South, you learn yeah. So right there, there's so many different words between North, South, and of course, Central. Second, when it comes to the comments, as you mentioned, I feel like a lot of people speak in slang. And even though Vietnamese is a monosyllabic language with short words already, they still find a way to shorten the words. For example, when you call someone M in messaging or comments, you just use E. 
when you call someone and you just put a, they still find a way to make the language shorter. Google Translate finds it difficult to get the proper translations, but I will admit outside of the comment sections, the AI captions app is getting quite good. It, it's more of based on what the context is versus literal translations. So I'm shocked. I was editing some videos today. I put it in the captions app. And I, I was blown away. But it had the idea with completely different words, but it had the idea and I was like, wow. So it took my English, got the context and then said something different in Vietnamese. You mentioned about slang. Are there any interesting ways that you're seeing Gen Z use, use Vietnamese language that you can think of? Yes. So I mentioned my first two week class in Vietnamese and I'm still friends with the original teacher in that, even though I didn't show a lot of enthusiasm initially in that class, she actually sent me a link, a Vietnamese guy breaking down some Gen Z words. So I made some videos on it in English. And yeah, they're getting very creative with it. For example, you have Yip Ha Cho. And I went around and asked the Vietnamese around me, hey, do you know Yip Ha Cho? And they said, sounds familiar. I don't know what it is. And I was like, okay. And then it turns out it is the scientific name for a plant that is known as the son of a bitch plant in Vietnamese. Okay, Cho Đe. And instead of calling each other Cho Đe in class, the kids can call each other Yip Ha Cho, which is imagine the Latin name of a plant that you've never heard of to refer to somebody being a son of a bitch. And I said, that is really creative. I like that. And there's another one, Salak Kim Kung. So Salak is a type of lettuce or salad. And then they take cabbage out of that, which is Kai. And then Kim Kung is Kui, which is precious. Now, again, this goes different levels. So it's not exactly a diamond doesn't mean precious, but it, a diamond is precious. And salak doesn't mean cabbage, but guy is in a salad. And then they do the thing long I told you about, and they switch it up. So instead of guy kui, they say kui guy, which kui is like a demon. And guy is the female classifier for an animal. So it's just like saying you devilish bitch or something like that. And it's from going from diamond salad to that, it's just levels to it. And I have fun understanding it as it goes along. My head is exploding right now. Just trying to get it around that. Yeah. So I would recommend instead for someone that's in a beginner phase to focus on the animal comparisons, which I talk about a lot in my Vietnamese word of the day. And Vietnamese love to compare people to animals in a good or a bad way. The one I hear a lot is mop nhu heo, mop being fat in a cute way, nhu as, and heo is a pig, so fat is a pig. You'll hear ngu nhu bò, ngu stupid, going back to when I called my mother-in-law a stupid slut, nhu as, and bò, a cow. There are so many of these. I even heard one from my mother-in-law the other day, and I made a lesson on it, Louis nhu hui. And I know Louie is lazy. I know new is as, but I said, what the heck is hui? I've never heard that one. So I get in my dictionary and look it up. And it's a leper, someone with leprosy. So it's you are lazy as a leper. And it's, it's not their fault. They're lazy. They have leprosy. And that was a new one for me. And I was like, wow, she's that's mainly from the North. She's from the North way back in the day. So, so you could look in the dictionary for that particular one. But with regards to the scientific name of a son of a bitch plant, how are you getting to the bottom of that? Are you just hanging out with Gen Z and saying, no, explain it to me again on a level? What are the levels here? Sometimes I had a, after I posted the first Gen Z video, I had a younger, I guess, a teenager message me with a bunch of different ones and explain them. I was appreciative of him for that. But my first tutor or teacher, if you will, she explained those for me in the beginning and free lesson, always good. Another one that I also did a lesson on is Hua Kut Lan. And literally translate, I can translate that. Hua is a flower and Kut is shit and Lan is a pig in the north. So there's a pig shit flower and in English it's the billy goat weed. And I, I said in my video, I said, shouldn't it at least be like goat shit flower instead of pig shit? Because it's billy goat weed. That one I could do myself, but that's not Gen Z. It's just for some reason they call like a son of a bitch plant, a pig shit flower. 
Like they have these words for stuff. And it also goes into combination words, which the literal meaning is really funny in English. Right. There are more like that as well, aren't they? I find those quite fascinating. Are they like compound nouns? Is that what they're called? I guess you could say, I mean, they go together. This is one thing I really enjoy with the language is how literal Vietnamese are. They look at a shark and they say, ga, it's a fish, mop, it's fat. It's a fat fish, ga mop, that's a shark. They say, they look at a dolphin and they go, oh, that looks like a pig fish. Ga, heo, ah, uh, ga is fish, heo is pig, it's a pig fish, a dolphin. Ga voi is a, an elephant fish, because elephant's big, whale. so a whale. Yeah, exactly. One of my favorites that I made a video on, chuot tui. So chuot is a mouse and tui is a pocket. What mouse has a pocket? Kangaroo. There you go. So that's what they call kangaroo, a mouse with a pocket. Wow. So I, I always enjoy those because they're easier to remember and it's funny. In one sense, Vietnamese seems super literal. And in another sense, just like completely metaphorical with all types of different meanings on different levels, maybe manipulated by a sound and switching out words and syntax and things. That's what I said before. It's a never ending journey. So as much as I appreciate your compliment on, oh, you being fluent in Vietnamese, personally, I don't consider myself fluent. I don't consider myself someone that can just listen and understand everything that's going on in terms of every word and what's being said. Because I look at myself in English and when I came back to America for the first time since COVID, I come back and people are using Riz, no cap. And I'm like, Riz, no, what do you mean no cap? What are you talking about? And in my own language, I got to question what's being said. So you can imagine your second language, there's always things coming out and you're always going to be learning something new. And that's what I enjoy about it. Have you got a favorite Vietnamese phrase that you learned early on and still like to use? The first slang words that I learned before I even focused on learning the language. And the first one that really pops in my head when you say that is com being no, ga to have, and go door. It means you don't have a door here. And I used to have a lot of teaching assistants on the weekends for my English teaching job. These are all college students that speak English. And I would ask them to teach me funny words because we're stuck in class two hours every weekend together. And this female TA of mine, she said, when guys flirt with me and I don't want anything to do with them, I tell them, Kom kua, you don't have a door here. You don't have a chance with me. And this is traditionally used by women for men. But then women would call me Dep Chai, handsome at the market. And I say, ah, im kom kua. And that was one of the first punchlines on my early videos. And their friends would all point and laugh at them. And that was one of my favorite ones to use. It seems pretty on brand for you. Yes. And I even saved it and used it on a TV show in 2022, I believe. Now, I, I feel bad because it, it was like a famous Vietnamese singer. And she was just trying to joke around with me in the intro for the show. And I was saying like, why Vietnamese women are so perfect. And she's like, oh, I have all those qualities. And I was like, yeah, but you don't have a chance with me. And everybody just starts falling over laughing. I'm like, oh, maybe that's not the best idea, you know, lose face on TV, but it was all in good fun. You've mentioned losing face a few times. What is that? You know, in society, everyone kind of holds a social standard for each other. And then when you do something that's not accepted by society, they look down on you for it. And I'll give an example where I find that Vietnamese, they're very open to speaking English with foreigners when they don't even speak any English. Hello, how are you? Where are you from? But they don't know what you're saying when you answer. So I took that attitude of always speaking to Vietnamese people without speaking Vietnamese back in 2015. And I went to Japan. And in Tokyo, I was trying to talk to everybody. I'm like, hey, how are you? Konnichiwa. Like, just trying to be just a nice guy. No filming or anything. Just going around. And man, Japanese, they would just turn and wouldn't even talk to me. It wasn't that they were being rude or mean. I was told that because in Japan, most people learn English in school, that they don't want to lose face in front of their counterparts, other Japanese people versus how they're going to speak to me. They don't care how I feel. They just don't want to be embarrassed in front of other Japanese people. And when they say something wrong in English, it was similar in Korea as well. Whereas in Vietnam, I can go up to anybody and just have a conversation and we can talk and they don't speak English. I don't speak Vietnamese, but we're still going to leave with a smile on our faces. 
the Vietnamese are much more forgiving with regards to language then you're not going to lose face for getting the language wrong. You've given it a try and that's great. What do you think would be the no-nos with regards to speaking in Vietnam that would actually make you lose face? Because I guess that joke that you made on stage didn't make you lose face. What do you think would make you lose face? I think it goes back to what I mentioned before. You don't want to speak ill of their culture, their food, their history. I think just being very rude. I'll give you an example. I was just giving a straight answer. My wife's aunt was visiting from Canada and she said, will you eat some shredded rice paper with me? My initial reaction, because I wasn't a big fan of it back then. I was like, oh, hey, that's so gross. And my wife looks at me. She's like, oh, you are so rude. You don't say that to an older person. So I guess speaking informally and speaking in a rude manner to Older people. That'll be my answer to the question because there's a lot of respect in terms of age and pronouns. So if I go and call a 50 year old guy my, and I refer to myself as thou, that would really lose my self face in the eyes of society. So, what have been some of your most popular YouTube and TikTok videos? Great question. As I mentioned, every year there's something that just takes off. First year was bringing a chicken around Saigon in women's pajamas. Whole storyline behind it sounds ridiculous, but it worked out. And then that led to me getting my own TV show on Vietnamese television. It's called One Day with Phuc Mop. And that led me to meeting up with Bat Thun Vlog. She was the little old lady up north that cooked gigantic dishes. And I went up to Hanoi and I messaged her son collaborated with them. And then I went from 90,000 to about 150,000 because she got 10 million views on our video. I got a million and a half views on our video. So that was a big one. And then the next year I went back to Florida. I took my grandma to eat Vietnamese food for her first time at 84 years old. She's like, wow, this is good. And that was 2 million views. I had another one where I worked at a broken rice place and just was a lazy employee brought the mindset of an American where you get to eat for free, working at a restaurant, take long breaks, and then basically got fired. That was viral. And then 2021, the arm wrestling. 2022, again, another random video, a travel buddy of mine, he's filming TikToks. I'm showing him around and he said, hey, make a TikTok. And I was like, dude, I, don't, I don't really don't care about TikTok. My TikToks, it's there, but I don't really care. He's like, dude, just make something. I said, all right, hold my phone. And I see these people holding this weird cat. It's like a cat with clothes on. And I go, guys, I'm out here on Winway Street. And I just found this dog. And then the camera pans over to the cat. And in Vietnamese, I'm like, what's the dog's name? And its owners, they say, cat. And I go, a dog named cat? Are you crazy? What? And that video, it got up to 40 million views. And it became number one trending on TikTok. And I'm like, how do I study Vietnamese for eight years at the time? And I say it wrong. And that's my most viral video ever. Um, and then this year on the same street, I had a buddy of mine who actually I did a podcast with him. That's how I met him. And he said, man, how funny would it be if you dressed up like one of those statues on Nguyen Hue? You painted yourself and you just stood out there with your red beard. I was like, that's a good idea. Then one of the statue guys came up to me the same night and is, hey, Fook Mop, can I get a picture? I'm like, hey, what's up? And I look at his phone and I see that he does the statue thing. And I said, hey, can you uh, help me do that? I'll give you guys all the money. I don't care about the money. I just want to make a video. He's like, sure. The next week had me out there on a box painted silver. And that's this year's viral video. Right. Yeah. Was it the calling a cat a dog video that really opened your eyes to the power of TikTok? Yes. In terms of Vietnam, yes, because that I went through, I think I had like 600,000 followers at the time, but then I went up to 900 something thousand and I was like, oh dang. And then I saw I was number one Vietnam. Personally, in the beginning, I never wanted to make a vertical video on any platform. I like my YouTube, make a 10 minute story that has a good punchline at the end. And then to me, it was almost lazy to just make a one minute video with a quick punchline, but you know, you remember Blockbuster, video rental place in America. So Blockbuster, they even, if I remember correctly, Netflix came to them and was going to sell Netflix to them. 
and they laughed them out of the room. And then Netflix, look at them now, Blockbuster's no more because they didn't keep up with the times. And that's how I look at it with TikTok is even though in the beginning I was, eh, I don't want to do this. I realized that, hey, you can't pass this up. You're going to get left in the dust because if you don't do it, someone else will. Therefore, I still pursue. And then that leads to Vietnamese word of the day now. All those videos in the past were what got me known by the Vietnamese audience in Vietnam. But Vietnamese word of the day introduced my content to the Vietnamese abroad. I see. When I'm speaking to potential partners overseas that are looking to enter Vietnam, they say, what's the social trends that we should be looking at? And, and I'm always saying, look, TikTok is the lowest hanging fruit in terms of building an audience, like quite quickly, more quickly than other channels. And it's got to be done. People are looking at short form. Everyone's on TikTok. I think there's more than half the population is on TikTok. In the Vietnamese community, it's huge. And like I said, even though it's not my preferred platform, I do what I have to do in order to keep up with it because I say it all the time. Like I've been at this for five years. I've enjoyed the growth I've had. I've enjoyed the hospitality, the welcoming nature of the Vietnamese community in terms of accepting my content. And I'm happy to keep producing that. But I know if I stop creating tomorrow, somebody else is going to jump in. And as I said, I don't feel like I can be replaced per se, but you can always be replaced in one form or another. So that's my motivation to keep going and release videos nearly every day. So what tips would you give to a global brand coming to Vietnam that wants to get their head around TikTok, for example? I think the most important is consistency. I think consistency on your channel or channels, uploading regularly, always putting yourself in front of your audience's face really helps not only with the audience, but also with the algorithm. They want to see people that are uploading regularly. Uh, you need to have a good hook at the beginning. You need to give people because TikTok is so easy to just switch YouTube. You have to click another video on the sidebar, but TikTok is just, eh, just go right through. So you need to get something that pulls them in. And then once they're invested in that video, you build up to whatever the punchline is at the end. And maybe like from our experience, I would probably add like tapping into trends, like maybe things that people are talking about on that day, whether it might be using the sounds or just joining a conversation that's already happening around something perhaps. I, I wanted to share that this morning, actually, randomly, a content creator buddy of mine that I've never actually met in person, his name is That Icelandic Guy, and he makes filming content for filmmakers. And he made a video on why he quit TikTok today. And I watched that video this morning and he talked about of all the platforms, it's the most difficult to build a community around you. So you mentioned the trends and yes, I have done trends and had viral videos from trends, but if you are trying to be as connected to your community and be a regular staple in their social media lives, the trend works for the company, but if for the individual creator, not so much. And he mentioned how with TikTok, he didn't feel like he could create that community in terms of a personal brand. What you watch is more determined by the For You page versus YouTube, you open up and you get nine choices or six choices, whatever screen you're on. You get these choices on what to watch. And like I open mine and I see six of the creators I watch the most or the content that I consume the most. Whereas TikTok, I open and it's gonna to try to catch me with one video. And if I watch that video for a long time and I scroll, I'm gonna get another video like that. Right. More so on TikTok, let's say, than the people you actually follow. The four page is just pushing all this yes. content that's served up via a pretty tight algorithm. And it means that the communities that you've actually chosen to participate in and be part of and follow aren't actually getting shown that much because it's just the for you page based on algorithm stuff. So I'll give you one more example. And this ties into the cat and dog video. The travel creator I mentioned is Travel with Chris. I helped him film for his channel and everything. So he's the one that encouraged me to make the cat dog video. Well, that same night, he asked me about tips on growing on social media because I was a lot bigger than him when I talked to him. And I said, you need to focus on Facebook because Facebook's a good community. And if you can get it monetized, it's a lot of extra income. At the time, he had 10,000 followers. And after the tips I gave him, he actually shouted me out in a story two weeks ago. He has grown from 10,000 to over a million followers in one year. 
And his biggest thing was consistency. In fact, we had a video call last week on him giving me tips on how to grow on Facebook. Cause I'm like, you obviously done it. And what he did is he uploaded multiple videos every single day for the whole year, short to the point videos that people want to see about travel. And it allowed him to grow exponentially. So in any platform, I think that applies where you just need to be consistent, consistent time, consistent upload schedule, consistent material, AKA Vietnamese word of the day in my case. But I think that's one of the biggest things I could share. Yeah. I'd like to add as well that while I always suggest TikTok as the lowest hanging fruit, Facebook is a must have. And the consistency and frequency thing is so important. It was actually what made our work with Netflix so successful, I think, because a lot of brands, when coming to Vietnam, I think they opt to do a kind of Chuk Mong Nam Oi, Happy New Year post, or the occasional post, like maybe once a week or once a month, just to tick a box. Yeah, we're, we're speaking to the Vietnamese market. But for us, we found that it's all about showing up daily and becoming relevant in the daily lives of Vietnamese, not only with one video a day, multiple videos a day. And that takes some commitment. It takes discipline. And it also takes patience as well, because we found that the audience kind of slowly builds and then suddenly it's like, bang, it's off. But a lot of people will quit before they see that big explosion. You just don't know how close you are to success with regards to audience growth in that sense. And also, it's not even just about viral spikes. It's like building an audience over time of genuine fans. People are going to share your shit and they're going to be your advocates and talk about you and tell their friends. I did a fan meetup three weeks ago in Oklahoma. My favorite part was these college students, Vietnamese kids, but Vietnamese American, coming up to me and they say how my mom and dad send me all of your videos just to tell me how my Vietnamese is no good and why does this white boy speak better than me? And then I would have to make a video for them on their phone to send to their mom and dad in Vietnamese asking why their kid doesn't speak Vietnamese. And to me, that was like, to know that I have my elders out there, Vietnamese in America or Vietnamese Americans, whatever it is, but they're just constantly sharing my work and helping that grow because I'm doing something that they are either astonished by, appreciative of, or just impressed by to the point where they want to send it to their own children and compare their children's Vietnamese to mine. That's just a very surreal experience, if you will. So I'd like to end these episodes by asking, what are you most excited about for Vietnam's future? Maybe your future in Vietnam or Vietnam's future generally. One thing I really enjoy seeing is the international recognition of Vietnam. Obviously in the food, I think somebody ranked bun mi as the number one sandwich in the world recently. I saw people sharing that on Facebook. Not only in the food, just in the cultural aspects itself, where, you know, Back before I moved to Vietnam, I didn't know a lot of differences between Asian countries. And I felt like a lot of people I went to school with didn't because we had Vietnamese American classmates, Japanese American classmates, Chinese American. And I didn't know the difference in any of the cultures. But I feel like in today's world, everyone has access to the Internet and more trends are getting out there that. Vietnamese culture is spreading through the world. And when people ask me what the goal is with my channel, basically it's to spread Vietnam, its culture, its language, and its food in a positive way. I just want to be a positive influence for the rest of the world, share what I've learned over the last nine years. I feel like it would almost be selfish of me to not share what I've learned. Therefore, I'm excited to see international recognition of Vietnam, its custom, its culture, its food, and just everything about it throughout the world in a positive light. I can really relate to that. I think that's what this podcast is about as well. I think so many people overseas either don't know anything about Vietnam or have the wrong idea about Vietnam. They still think it's X, Y, and Z from 30, 40, 50 years ago. And it's really not. It's a super dynamic, exciting market that's got so much to offer. Yeah. You know, when it first came up, the idea of teaching English in Vietnam, I'm not going to lie. I thought I was going to be out in the sticks in the countryside teaching kids with no air conditioning. Like I had no idea what this country has to offer. And I'm so glad that I came here and found out about that. And now I'm able to share that 
in my little sliver of the social media space. You've been listening to You Don't Know Vietnam. I'm Ian Painton from We Create Content. I'd like to thank DJ Jace from the Beat Saigon for their epic soundtrack. And a massive thank you to you for making it all the way to the end.